Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome this morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus. Welcome. It is good to be here with you this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, Your Word promises us that the prayers of Your people are powerful and effective. And so in this hope, we call on Your name. Pour out Your healing grace, O Lord, and send forth Your Spirit to save us. We pray for those who are sick and suffering those we have named before you, and those we keep in the silence of our hearts. We ask, O oh God, for healing, for strength, for comfort, and relief from pain and suffering. Pour out your healing grace, O oh Lord. Send forth Your Spirit to save us. We pray for those who are burdened by sin, for everything that separates us from You and from each other. We pray for our nation as we are a people divided amongst ourselves, We pray for healing of the wounds that words have brought. We pray for those who struggle with forgiveness, whether it is in giving or in receiving. And we ask, O oh God, for reconciliation for those who have been torn apart. Pour out Your healing grace, O Lord. Send forth Your Spirit to save us. We pray for all nations, those that are thriving and those that are struggling to survive. We pray for nations crumbling in conflict and war. We pray, O oh God, that You would bring peace. That You would guide the leaders of the nations to seek the best for all of their people and to seek the best for their neighbors around them. Pour out Your healing grace, O Lord. Send forth Your Spirit to save us. We pray for our neighbors, for this community, and for Your church. May You work in and through us to show the love of Jesus Christ, not only in words, but in actions and deeds. That our neighbors and this community would know that here in this place, they will find welcome and love and community. and that they too belong to You and to Your people. Pour out Your healing grace, O Lord. Send forth Your Spirit to save us. 
We pray, O God, for all of creation. For those in in this world who are suffering because of changes in our climate. As wildfires continue to burn and hurricanes bring death and destruction and flooding wipes away homes. We pray, O oh God, that your creation would be renewed as well. And that we would live into our original job description. Just as Adam and Eve were care- given the responsibility to care for creation in the garden, we too have that same responsibility. And so, O oh God, help us to tend to creation in responsible ways. Pour out Your healing grace, O Lord. Send forth Your Spirit to save us. God of new life, raise us up in the power of the risen Lord so that we may lift our hearts again in songs of thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, by the power of your Spirit, enlighten our eyes, instruct our minds, Rejoice our hearts and revive our souls so that our lips and our lives may bear witness to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first scripture reading is, comes from Numbers chapter 11. And the lectionary uh, kind of skips around a little bit um, in order to break up what would be a much larger reading. Um, And uh, suffice it to say, uh, we're reading selected verses here, 4 through 6, 10 through 16, and 24 through 29. And uh, if, if you haven't learned anything about uh, Moses and the people of God uh, in the wilderness, that lo and behold, they are complaining against him again and against God that things are not going the way uh, they had hoped or expected. And uh, God has a solution uh, for them, and it, it wasn't exactly uh, what they expect reading from Numbers chapter 11, uh, selected verses. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat! We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families at all the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, 
Why have you treated your servants so badly? Why, why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burdens of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that they should come to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to that land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they come weeping to me and say, Give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting, and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered seventy elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, my Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to, to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put His Spirit on them. A reading of a very similar situation Jesus has with his disciples in Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never 
for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's really hard to blame Moses. After all, it seems like every time we crack open this story, it seems like in a different place, again, the people of God are complaining against God and by proxy against Moses as well for bringing them out into the wilderness that life is not going the way expected or planned. Boy, there is no time like the present to learn that lesson. How many times have you made plans or had expectations for how life should go and it went that way? Anyone? I have not. If I had a nickel for every plan that I made and it went the way I wanted, I would be broke. If I had a nickel for every plan that I made that got sent asunder, I'd be rolling in nickels. Life just doesn't go the way that it's planned or expected. At least from our planning and our expectations. God has a different set of plans and a different set of expectations. It's difficult for us to see when we are in the moment. Like the Israelites, when things don't go the way we plan or want, we think about the good old days when we had what we wanted, lots of meat, onions, good things to eat. And Moses, it was obvious, was in way over his head. I think every pastor can empathize with Moses. I've never met a pastor who was not in over their heads. It's part of the deal. It's part of the deal when we follow God to be called to a ministry that, quite frankly, we cannot do on our own. In fact, we were never meant to do on our own. You see, that's the lesson here for Moses. Moses is ready to die. I love the fact that a couple of people chuckled. It is... It is actually kind of amusing. In verse 15, Moses says, If this is the way you are going to treat me, I'm going to take my ball and go home. No, actually, he says, Just put me to death at once. If I found any favor in your sight, do do not let me see my misery. And so God has a plan for Moses. 
And that plan is sending help. Now this is, for the Israelites, this is a temporary fix. For God sends help, and the elders gathered, and He gives them, God gives them a portion of the Spirit that was given to Moses, and they help Moses by proclaiming the Word of the Lord, but it's only a temporary fix. It's a foreshadowing of a story yet to come. And Moses dreams of the day, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them. Now we as Christians, when we read this story, we read it backwards. We read it from the post-Pentecost perspective. And Pentecost is that day that we celebrate the loosening, the giving of the Spirit. No longer is the Spirit of God given out in little doses for small places and times. No longer is the Spirit of God contained in an ark held in a temple. But the Spirit of God is let loose on God's people. And in many ways, generation and generations after Moses, his prayer was answered. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put His Spirit on them. The burden now is not just on Moses. The burden is on us all. Jesus' disciples struggle with someone preaching and proclaiming the good news, but it's not someone within Jesus' group. You see, we have a problem. It's not just the disciples, but... It's within the church as well. Who's authorized? Who's in the inside? And who's on the outside? It's a struggle. It's a struggle for the church today. In fact, many churches have found themselves put into a very interesting position uh, due to this pandemic. And it's because there are now people joining, uh, participating in churches virtually from uh, places that are outside of the geographic bounds of the congregation. In fact, we have more than one uh, regular worship attendee from Portland. I happen to know there are lots of really good churches in Portland, and yet... Somehow, for some reason, people have chosen to worship with us. And I think that is fantastic. Talk about Pentecost. Talk about the Spirit being let loose and the Word of God spreading in ways that, quite frankly, I never would have imagined when I went to seminary. I had no idea that I would end up being a televangelist. <laughs> Imagine that. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's funny too. (laughs) Churches are struggling with how do we fit people in. In fact, there's a larger conversation going on out in social media amongst leaders in the Presbyterian churches. What do we do when these people want to become members? And they've never stepped foot in the building of the church. It's caused the church to have these conversations about what does it mean to actually be a member? Who's inside and who's outside? These are actually some fascinating conversations and some exciting times in which we live. But Jesus makes it very clear. 
Jesus opens the door quite widely. John says to Jesus, We saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Uh huh. Jesus says, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. And here comes my favorite verse in this whole reading. Whoever is not against us is for us. Think about that for a minute. Jesus is widening the reach of who is actually involved in ministry so much wider than we might tend to do otherwise. And he's including people that quite frankly make his disciples just a little bit uncomfortable. And that's a good thing. Whoever is not against us is for us. Now I've heard a similar saying like this. And in fact, I've heard it from, a, uh, from politicians that quite frankly it bothers me. It is very similar to this saying, but the meaning is very different. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not show me absolutely undying loyalty is my enemy. Heard that before, haven't we? In fact, that same attitude of whoever is not with me is against me that attitude has seeped into our culture. And ultimately, that is what is causing, in my opinion, our greatest divisions. Is that we have our camps of those who are inside our camp and those who are outside our camp. And I'm just going to call it what it is. Democrats and Republicans. Conservatives and progressives. Yes, I brought politics into church. <laughs> but those attitudes, those attitudes of whoever is not with us is against us, creates enemies. And it polarizes even more. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could somehow, maybe through a vaccine, if we could somehow give to politicians this same attitude that Jesus had, whoever's not against us is for us. It totally changes the dialogue and the perspective. It allows us to stand back and say, well, if you're not actively working against me, then maybe there are some things we can work together on. Anyone remember the day when politicians used to do that? It actually did happen, I'm told. <laughs> Once or twice. But let's bring it back to the church. Because quite frankly, we don't have a whole lot of control over what they do, uh, whether it be in Salem or in Washington. We do get control when we vote. But what do we do in the church? Do we have that attitude of whoever's not with us is against us? Thankfully, I don't see that here. 
Quite frankly, if I saw that here, I'm not sure I would be the best person to be your pastor. But we don't have to look very far outside of ourselves to see that same attitude in Christian churches. There are far too many Christians out there who are convinced that they will be the only ones in heaven. I can't wait to see the look on their face when I show up. I expect more than one person to be surprised. You see, when we have this same attitude of Jesus, whoever is not against us is for us. We throw open the gates to those who can be involved in what we are doing. And what is it that we are doing? We are loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. What is it that we are doing? We are feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving shelter to the homeless. We are doing what Christ calls us to do. And Jesus is telling us quite pointedly, if you see somebody doing this, don't stop them. Herein lies the rub. They may not look like us. They may not act like us. They may not be us. Quite frankly, I know more than one non-Christian person who acts more Christ-like than a handful of Christian people that I know who are very far from what it means to be Christian. The challenge for us is to welcome. The challenge for us is to include. The challenge for us is to involve those who are passionate about doing the things that Christ does and loving the people that Christ loves. A lot of, in fact, too much attention goes to verses 42 through 48. It's very easy to miss the message in verses 38 through 41, the whoever is not against us is for us part. Because we get caught up in the millstone being tied around our neck and thrown into the sea and cutting off hands and poking out eyes because, quite frankly, it's a little disturbing. It's a good thing we are not literalists because if we were all literalists, we would be one-handed, one-legged, half-blind people. If anyone, if you run into anybody who wants to interpret Scripture literally, point them to these verses and ask them why they have not plucked their eye out yet. The word here, the mechanism, is called hyperbole. You may remember it from a junior high or high school uh, English class. Hyperbole is a wild exaggeration used to make a point. And I think Jesus has made his point quite well. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones, talking about the people who are not against us but who are for us, He says, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. He's deadly serious about this. The welcoming part. The nurturing, the loving part. 
He has swung open the door, cast wide the net, and welcome anyone who wants to come and participate and be involved in his life and in his ministry. Come and be welcome and be a part of what is going on. For truly I tell you, he says, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no mean means lose their reward. So who's on the inside and who's on the outside? Who's with us? Who's against us? Jesus makes it very clear. We are to open those doors wide and let them in. For this is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith as is printed in the bulletin. This is the good news that we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Dear friends, let us open wide the doors of the church, open wide the doors of our hearts, and welcome in the people Christ has called to Him. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit abide with all of us, today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.